on our congregation as a small town pastor, uh, you realize that your people need something from the Lord. And so as a pastor of a small town church, I feel the need to address all the pain, all the anger, all the frustration, everything that's happened, everything that's taken place. And show you in the Word of God, even in the midst of heartache, trouble, and trial, there's hope Amen. in Jesus Christ. And there's a plan of action. So many people today are saying, what can I do? There's nothing we can do, Pastor. I disagree with that. What can we do? We're going to address those issues today. I'm not going to make it all about the accident. However, I am going to minister to that. And in doing so, the first thing that I want to do is I've already heard a couple of times about the song that Katie wrote. Mm -hmm. i got to thank the Lord for my daughter, Katie. She allows herself at a young age to be used by the Holy Spirit in a way to bless people. And so I'm going to... I asked her if she was okay to do this today. She said she was. I know it's a tough thing for me to stand up here and minister to you today. It was a tough thing for you to lead us into prayer. I can only imagine what it must be like on the shoulders of a 15-year-old girl who allowed the Holy Spirit to move through her. But I'm going to ask you, Katie, if you can come and sing this song. This isn't necessarily a gospel song, but it's a song and a message. And I think it's a message that I'll
What a wonderful song, Katie. Thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you. There's such a message in that song, folks, that I could probably just open the altars up right now. And And close the service. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just saying that there's a true message in this song. For those of you that are going to follow with me in the scripture this morning, I want you to open your Bibles up to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And I want you to be in chapter number 10. We're going to get away from messages that I have been preaching here lately on what are use. If the Holy Spirit will allow me, we'll go back to that next week. You remember I preached what you waited for. There's so many other messages like that when it's on my heart and on my mind, but today I really feel a need to go into the scripture and to Take a look at a day in Scripture where Jesus is teaching a very profound message. And it's one that I believe applies to the Old Navy Church this morning. I believe it applies to the Old Cross Road Church. I believe it applies to the Faith Outreach Church. I believe that it applies to every assembly that's gathered together on this Sunday morning. It's a message of hope. It's a message of healing. And certainly, we need healing in our communities today. Amen. Certainly, we need healing in our congregations today. The brother said it, that it is so thick in here you can feel it. And it's the truth. But I want you to know that not only do we feel what we're feeling today as far as the tragedy goes, but I'm feeling the love of the Holy Spirit today. Amen? I'm feeling the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Someone can ask you, how can you possibly feel any kind of peace at a time like this? Don't even try to explain it, folks, because even the Scripture says that the peace of God surpasses all understanding. I can't even explain something to you that I personally don't understand. How, how can I have the peace in my heart and my mind that I have today in the face of such tragedy? It's because I understand a few things about life. More importantly, I understand a few things about who my God is. So today we're going to, I know there's all kinds of questions. have held on to my cell phone this week. I can't tell you how many times my phone has rang and I'll answer it and it's somebody else saying, why did this have to happen, Pastor? Why, why does this kind of stuff take place? Only to have to tell them I don't have those answers. When you call, when you call a pastor looking for answers, and the pastor says, "I, I don't have any kind of answers." Can you imagine how the rest of those conversations went? I've had people, perfect strangers that I don't even know, reach out to me through Facebook over a video that I posted, a song that my daughter sang, with the same questions: Why? Why? What can we do now? I'm going to attempt to answer those questions today following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to be in the book of Luke chapter 10. I'm going to start reading verse number 30. Say amen when you're there. Amen. And Jesus answering said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Now this is coming on the heels of Jesus having a conversation with a certain lawyer that stood up and tempted him. 
He, he wasn't wanting to hear what Jesus had to say because it was Jesus. And Jesus has all the truth and all the wisdom and all the knowledge. He came to Jesus, this certain lawyer, hoping maybe to get into some kind of a conversation with him where he could, where he could tempt Jesus into an argument or an exchange of words. And this lawyer, being as smart as this lawyer is, would be able to trip Jesus up in their conversation and he could come out looking like the winner of the argument. The winner of the debate. I tell you as your pastor today, there's way too much debate that's taking place in our world today. This certain lawyer came to Jesus and tempted him, wanted to know what can he do that he might have eternal life. And Jesus, knowing that he was a lawyer, he said, well, you're a lawyer. That's your expertise in life. Tell me, what does the law say? <laughs> Well, the man answered him that you need to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And then Jesus told him, if you do this, then you will live. And the scripture teaches us that this lawyer, attempting to justify himself, and aren't today we trying to justify our every action? I mean, lay aside the tragedy that has happened this week and just take a look at the lives of people. Take a look at your own life. How often do we try to justify what we say and justify what we do? This lawyer, attempting to justify himself, says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered this question by painting a picture. And I'm going to attempt to follow the example of Jesus Christ and paint some pictures for you today. Jesus answering him said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed and left him half dead. Can I tell you the first thing, the first blessing that blesses me and I hold it? The first thing that blesses me, and I hope that it's a blessing to you, is the very first thing we see in Jesus' answer are two words, three words, a certain man. I am so glad today to know that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Amen? Amen. Aren't you glad today to know that He's your Savior? He's yours. Joyce, Jesus is yours. He's something you can wrap your arms around and hold on to because he cares about you and you and you and you. Every one of us, there's not one person sitting in here. Listen, we're all sharing the same church. We're all sharing the same song books. We're all sharing the same pews. We're all sharing and sharing and sharing. But I want you to come to understand today that as you share life, you have a God who is concerned about you personally today. Amen. And that's healing. That's power today, folks. Because right now, I would venture to say that there's more people in here than just a few that are, that are feeling so empty right now and feeling so alone and so lost and so without hope. And you're searching for something that you can stand upon. And Jesus Christ is that solid rock. He said in his answer, there was a certain man. He looked upon the single solitary soul in this story who had a problem. And today, if you have a problem in your heart, in your mind, trying to understand or trying to cope or trying to come to terms, you need to understand that you might come to me and I might say, I love you, but I don't have those answers. You are held in the hands of a Jesus who cares for you. I may not have those answers, but he does. Oh, thank you, Lord, for a healing. A certain man, an individual. He went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Thieves grabbed a hold of this man. Thieves. 
strip this man of his clothes. Thieves robbed him and stole from him everything that he had upon his person. And then they weren't happy with that. They beat this man to the point where they figured him to be dead. And then like some stray lost dog, they threw him on the wayside went about their way. It's an injustice, isn't it? When we read this, I gotta tell you, when I read this, the fighter in me wants to go to where this happened and find these men and say, hey pal, why don't you come try that to somebody a little bit bigger than this man? I've got to be honest with you. If I'm going to be your pastor, I need to be honest with you. Anytime that we are faced with an injustice, if you have any compassion in you at all, if you have any love of you in you at all, anytime we are faced with an injustice such as this one, it does something on the inside. But can I tell you something? That's a reaction of the flesh. It's not a reaction of the spirit. Give me a moment. I'll teach you that. By chance, there came down a certain priest that way. Oh, praise the Lord. This man is going to find some help. Here comes a priest. Certainly the priest would help him. <coughs> when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. We're living in a day and an age where we can no longer pass by on the other side. We're living in a time in the end time where Jesus teaches us because the love, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I believe today, as we've already talked about a little bit, you cannot escape the injustices that are taking place in our world today. You can't go home and close your door and shut out the rest of the world. And have the healing, loving, nurturing time with your family and your friends. And, 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 and operate under the guise that this is what's happening out here. But right here at home, this is a safe place. Because homes are no longer a safe place. And the reason homes are no longer a safe place is because our computers and our radios and our televisions and our newspapers are bringing the injustices of the world into the house. And we can't escape. So what happens is we're constantly angered. What happens is we're constantly outraged. What happens is, is we're constantly sad. <laughs> this priest walked by him on the other side. We cannot possibly walk by on the other side any longer. As long as there's a child that throws himself from a second story window to keep from being bullied, it doesn't matter how long the bullying has taken place. What matters is to seek and to stop things from happening and we need to stop these injustices that are taking place in our world. I need your prayers, folks. Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. My mind is going faster than my mouth can catch up right now. So the priest has let us down. Verse 32, and likewise the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked upon him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion on him. Say this with me, compassion. Amen. This is a word that I want the Omega Church to become so familiar with that it becomes an everyday part of Omega Church's life. I can't pastor somebody else's church. I can only pastor my own church. And as you sit here today and I'm pastoring you, I want you to understand and to learn the word compassion. I want it to become an everyday part of your vocabulary. But more importantly than that, I want it to become an everyday part of your actions. We need compassion in our world today. We're going to address that here in just a moment. Verse 34, And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and took, took him to an inn and took care of him. You see, when you're moved with compassion, the 
then compassionate things happen. And we need to see compassionate things happen. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. And Jesus asked this question, Which now of these three thinkest thou was a neighbor to him that fell upon the thieves? Which one of these three? Jesus said, In your own heart and in your own mind, which one of these three was the neighbor to the one who had such a great need in his life? Do you suppose it was the priest? Do you suppose that it was the Levite? Or do you suppose maybe it was the Samaritan? It was the Samaritan. And these religious people who were so bent on being right and were so bent on being angry and were so bent on being outraged could not even bring themselves to answer the question in its entirety. They all agreed that it was the Samaritan. But do you see them say, Jesus, it was the Samaritan? No. Even in the face of the truth, even in the presence of the personal teaching of Jesus Christ, they were so overtaken with their own pride, with their own emotions, that they wouldn't even answer the question correctly. Jesus said, which one of these do you suppose was a neighbor to the man? And not one of them, not one of them said, the Samaritan. You're saying, wait a minute, preacher. I'm reading this with you. That's what they said. No, that's not what they said. Just like the, just like the lawyer before them who tried to justify themselves, they fell under a spirit of self-justification. They did not say the words, the Samaritan. They couldn't bring themselves to say the word Samaritan because they were Jews, because they were Levites, because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans and the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews. Do you think that in this day and age we're living in that we're the only ones who has ever had a race problem in our world? Do you think that, that the difference between colors of skin is only unique to the United States of America? <laughs> No. These men would not answer the question correctly because the correct answer would have been the Samaritan. But instead of saying the Samaritan, they said, he that showed mercy on him. You say, that you're splitting hairs. It's the same thing. I'm not splitting hairs. To me, it's absolutely blatant and obvious. And it should be blatant and obvious to us. And the reason it's not blatant and obvious to us is because we've gotten so callous and grown so used to all of the hatred and all of the anger and all of the outrage that we're surrounded by on a daily basis that we cannot escape that this just has become normal to us and we no longer see the injustices that are in our world. Amen. Amen. It's like having... Ten virgins in one room, five being wise, five being foolish, and all ten of them slumbering together. When you're slumbering, you don't pay attention to what's going on. Last night I was sitting in my chair, we were watching TV, we had the hog roast, and it was a long night. We put a lot of work into that. I sang and played the guitar for hours. We cooked and we served and we cleaned and by the time we got home, it was 9 o'clock at night. Laura and I both just made it into the house. I don't know which one of us kicked off our shoes quicker than the other one. We had shoes flying through the air. The jammers was going on. And we were in a foot race to the front room. And when we sat down in our chairs, it was just, ah. And she's talking to me. And I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> and then I told her, and I woke up, and I said, huh? Man, I almost fell asleep in here. She said, almost. I said, yes. She said, almost. I said, yes, almost. She said, I didn't know almost people almost snored. <laughs> Here's the thing. I love you, honey. But I couldn't tell you what in the world you were telling me last night because I was slumbering. 
When you're slumbering, you don't pay attention. When you're slumbering, you don't get it. When you're slumbering, you don't hear it. When you're slumbering, you don't see it. And I believe our church world has been slumbering to the point where we no longer see, we no longer hear, and we no longer get. Hear me today. It's time for the divisions to come together. It's time for the hurting to start healing. It's time for the church to wake up and be the righteousness and be the life and be the love and be the peace of Jesus Christ in a fallen world. Amen. We can no longer afford to sleep in slumber. Don't remind me of that tonight when I hit my chair. <laughs> <laughs> this story is a perfect story for today. This story is a perfect story for every church across our whole nation, but certainly for the churches in our own community. I've never struggled so much in my life to preach a message. As we look upon this story and we see what happened to this man, we have to ask ourselves, why? Why did this have to happen? What did this man possibly do to deserve such treatment? Do you know? I challenged you to read the scripture with me. What did he do to warrant this? What did he do to deserve this? Can anybody tell me? Look at your Bibles again. Take a look at the scripture. I'll give you another moment. Read it for yourselves. Find me one line in those scriptures that will allow you to say, Pastor, here it is. This is what this man did. Here's why this happened to him. Anybody? Anybody? No? Because you're not going to find it. He didn't do anything to deserve this. He's just a guy. He, he got up in the morning, he ate a bowl of oatmeal, he drank a cup of coffee, put a little bit of money in his pocket, buttoned up his jacket, went out of his house. Maybe he petted his little dog on the head before he left. Maybe his wife was combing her hair and getting ready to go to work herself. Maybe his daughter was in the bathroom and was straight or getting ready to go to school. Maybe he said, honey, I'm leaving for work. And she said, hold on a second. And she comes running out and kisses him. Fine. Maybe he hollers into the bathroom, hey, Katie, I love you. I hope you have a good day. Maybe she said, I love you too, Dad. I hope you have a good day. He said, I will. Tonight when we get home, hey, you know, we got to go to Kokomo. We've been trying to get to Kokomo for days. Maybe tonight we can just, let's just make a plan. We're going to go to Kokomo tonight. All right, we'll do that. And he buttoned up his coat. And he put his money in his pocket. And he left the house. He locked the door behind him because he knew the world he was living in. is it the greatest world. And in his presence, he doesn't want somebody to say the guy just left us. We locked the door behind him. Oh, and where he's praying, Lord, watch over my family today. Keep them safe. Keep them healthy. Save those that are lost. Bring us all home at the end of this day as a family should. And I'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. I just painted a picture for you of the day in the life of Pastor Ted. This day, maybe that man did all that. And maybe this day that man locked the door and closed it and walked across the street to get into his truck to go to work. It was taken. Pulled his jacket off of it. Took the money out of his pockets. Beat him, beat him, beat him. So he said, there's no life left in him. Throw him next to the curb and get out of there before the wife and the daughter have the chance to realize what's happened. Hmm. I'm not trying to make it so somber. I need to paint a picture. Why did it happen to this man? I don't know. It happened. I don't know why it happened. But it happened. Why did such a horrible thing happen to this man? Why would such a tragedy happen to this man? Can I ask you a question today? Why do tragic things happen still yet today? I don't know. Do you know? Because if you know, I want to know. Because I don't know. Why do tragic things have to happen? I can tell you, tragic things happen because we are living in an imperfect world where bad things happen to good people. Our world is an imperfect world. This is not a perfect world. 
and man fell because of sin, our world became a sinful, wicked, cruel place to live. And in a perfect world, in a perfect world, listen, in a perfect world, there would be no harm. In a perfect world, there would be no heartache. In a perfect world, there would be no sickness. In a perfect world, there would be no sin. In a perfect world, there would be no man who was attacked and left for dead. In a perfect world, there would be no accidents. In a perfect world, there would be no harm. In a perfect world, there would be no tears. But we're not living in a perfect world. One day, when Jesus comes, John the Revelator said, And I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, because the former has passed away. Hear me today, there's coming a time when this earth shall melt with a fervent heat. The Bible says even the very elements of the air shall melt with a fervent heat. Amen. And John saw a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. There's coming a day when there will be no sin. There's coming a day when there will be no fallen man. There's coming a day when there will be perfect peace and love and joy. But today is not that day. And because we're living in an imperfect world, bad things happen to good people. All week long, I've had one call after another, one text message after another, everyone asking the same thing. Why, Pastor Thad? Why? And I've told them like I'm telling you, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I do know the one that knows the answers. And that one is Jesus Christ. The next thing I want to point out to you in these scriptures as we read them together is who. Okay, we've already addressed the why. Now let's address the who. What are you talking about that? Who all was affected by this tragedy in the parable? So I want you to take a look at this. Before I break it down, before I teach you something, who was affected in this parable? Anybody care to answer? Who? Oh, yeah. But at first glance, when we look at this, oh, the reason I painted that picture that I painted for you is because at first glance, all we can see that is affected by this parable was the man who got beat up and robbed. But it goes deeper than just that man who got beat up and robbed. He's the obvious one. But also the good Samaritan was affected by this, wasn't he? I mean, he's the one. He's the one who saw the man laying on the road half dead, stripped naked, beat up, and robbed. And he was moved. It affected him. And in here, just a few moments, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declare a truth to you that maybe, maybe you've heard it before, maybe you haven't. And as I read this parable, this good Samaritan, to me, is a picture of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's a picture and a type of Christ, but he's also a picture and a type of the church. And I believe that it's the church's place to notice these things. And I believe it's the church's place to do something about these things. But who was involved? Who was affected? Who was affected by this tragedy? Obviously, the certain man was affected by this tragedy. Obviously, the good Samaritan was affected by this tragedy. But can I tell you something? The priest and the Levite had to have been affected by this tragedy as well. You say, wait a minute. They walked on. They did nothing. You cannot see an injustice like that and not have an effect. Have you ever in your life felt like you needed to do something and then you didn't do it and then later on in the day you think, man, I hope I get the opportunity to do that again because I blew it. It happens a lot. It doesn't make you a bad person. Okay? It don't make you a bad person. It just means that we're, we're people that needs to take every opportunity that we can take to be the church of Jesus Christ. Another person that was affected by this tragedy was the keeper of the inn. 
Amen. Can you imagine being the keeper of the inn when the Samaritan shows up with this guy that's beaten and half dead and naked and, and robbed? And you hear a knock on your door and you open it and, and here's this guy maybe perhaps holding this beaten up man in his arms saying, he needs a bed. Do you got somewhere we can lay him down? In a moment, in a blink of an eye, he's either going to say, yeah, bring him in. Or, no, I'm sorry. I don't want a part of this. Take him to the end down there. I'm thankful. I'm thankful to see how this one was affected because he opened his door and said, I've got a room right here, number 127. You don't even have to go upstairs. It's on the main floor. Just go down here. Here's the key. We've got fresh linens and there's a coffee pot in the, in the room for you. Open up the door. Lay him down. There was no contract signed. There was no money exchanged. Did you get that? He just opened up the door and said, bring him in. And then after laying him down and after, and after treating his wounds and after taking care of him, he turns to the innkeeper and says, hey, I'm going to pay you. And I want you to take care of him. I want you to watch over him. Anything he needs, you give it to him. And when I come back, I'll pay you for it. There's your picture of Christ. Amen. There's your picture of Christ. Christ takes care of us. Christ heals us. Christ saves us. Christ delivers us. Christ provides for us. And when he comes back, if there's anything that's owed, he's going to take care of it. We don't need to do that. God said, vengeance is mine, say it to the Lord. I shall be paid. It's not our place to pay that. It's his. And I praise the name of the Lord that, he's a, that this is a picture of Jesus Christ. But it's also a picture of the church because the love of Christ, the spirit of Christ lives and dwells in the heart of every believer. And when we come together collectively as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be doing the work of Christ. We need to be seeking to heal and not destroy. We need to be, I'm getting ahead of myself. Who was affected by this? Somebody said everybody was affected. That's the truth. Even the ones hearing this story, these religious Pharisees that were hearing this story, even they were affected. How many of us today have been affected by the stories that we've been hearing all week long? We weren't on the scene. We didn't see it happen. I'm not a bus driver. I'm a truck driver. I wasn't driving that bus. I don't go to that school. I don't live in that trailer community. I didn't know them people from Adam, but I heard the story. And it affected me. You heard the story. And it's affected you. If it didn't affect you. I pray for your lost soul. Because there's something wrong. In your heart. If this didn't have an effect on you. Everyone was affected. The parents of the children. Were affected. The grandparents of these children. Were affected. The extended family and friends, the first responders, the passers-by. This morning I answered a text message from somebody I don't know saying my neighbor was on the road when that happened. He was one of the first ones that had to drive around the mess. And he's having troubles. And I don't know you and you don't know me. And he doesn't know you and you don't know him. But he needs someone to talk to. Are you willing? He said, yes, I'm willing. His parents were affected. Could you imagine? Can you imagine losing all of you? In one swift swoop, your children to be gone. Fathom that. The grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, the extended family, the friends, the first responders, the passers-by, the drugs, the bus driver, the school systems, the whole community, everyone has been affected by what has happened. But there's something that we're failing to understand. There's one, there's one, a whole other aspect of this that nobody is stopping to consider. There's a girl whose name is Alyssa Shepard. Who has been affected by this. 
Jesus Christ is the only one who came by way of immaculate conception. So that tells me that Alyssa Shepherd has a mother and Alyssa Shepherd has a father. Can you for a moment imagine what it must be like to be Alyssa Shepherd's dad right now? Or her mother? Can you for a moment imagine what it must be like to be her brother or her sister? How about this? Do you know she has a husband? Do you know she has children? What must it be like for a little child to say, Dad, what's going on with Mom? How would you answer that question? How would you answer it? How would you answer that question? Well, I don't know, but I know one thing. No, no, stop. Preacher, you go, you go right ahead and, and you tell us about the bus driver. Our hearts go out there. Or her, or whoever it was. You go ahead and you tell us about the mom and the dad and the grandparents. We're behind you on that, but don't. I'm going to. I'm going to because I need to. I'm going to because somebody has to. I'm going to because it's the right thing. And I cannot preach and teach to you to live a life of righteousness if I refuse to do the right thing. Amen. Amen. I have to. I have to. I have to. There's a girl named Alyssa Shepherd, and she's been affected. Her family and her children and her husband and her mother and her father and extended family and her friends, everyone... Everyone needs healing. Everyone needs a healing. I want to paint a picture for you. Maybe you know a little bit about this. Maybe you don't. Maybe today you are saying, I hope that when I get to church today, the pastor doesn't go on and on and on about this because I really just want to put it behind me. Friend, we cannot put it behind. We can't. So I want to paint a picture for you. I'm not a bus driver, but I am a truck driver. And I know that area very well. And it's dark. There's no lighting up there. It's dark. I mean, when it's dark out there, it's dark. And on that morning, it was raining. And on that morning, it was foggy, which makes it even worse. And it's a 55-mile-an-hour highway. And there's a bridge. And there's a curve. And the moment you go around the curve, you're at a trailer park. And you say, yeah, but if she wouldn't have been... <laughs> no, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I just want you to see it. I want you to put yourself in that vehicle. I want you to put yourself there. I want you to understand something. I've driven around that curve so many times. And you are on that trailer park before you know it. Now, maybe she was distracted, maybe she wasn't, but if you add the distraction factor into it, that makes it, that makes it worse. So why was she so distracted? Why, 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 why? So here we are, back to the why's again. Here's something else maybe you didn't know. Her dad was in the hospital, having an open heart surgery. Her mom's with her dad in the hospital. She lives here. Her little brother lives over here. You're going to have to go get your little brother to school for me because I'm with your dad. And then when you can, get to the hospital. So she goes, picks up her little brother. She's trying to get him to school. Driving down a 55 mile an hour highway. And it's dark, and it's raining, and it's foggy. And she's worried about her dad. And maybe her mom did text. Maybe her mom called her. I don't know. Maybe she picked up her phone. Maybe she called her mom. Maybe her two kids in the back seat and her brother. Maybe she turned around and said, would you stop fighting? How many of you have taken your eye off the road for a split second? Huh? How many of you have driven down the road with one hand, eating a hamburger with the other? And dropped some mayonnaise on your lap and a tomato. If you ever try to eat a Whopper going down the road, there's something wrong. <laughs> Because you can't eat a Whopper without making a mess. And if you're going down the road hanging on to the wheel with one end and eating a Whopper with the other and a tomato falls out and you're thinking, man, i got to go to work and do this. See what I mean? You see what I mean? How many times have you driven down the road and somebody called you and you're fishing for your phone to answer it? And for a split second, you take your eye off the road. How many times have you had a grandchild or a little child in the back seat that's trying to open the door and you're going down a 55 mile 
Have you ever dropped something on the floor, been over to pick it up? I'm going to tell them the story. <laughs> when Laura and I were dating, weren't married yet, we were dating, I knew she was, we were going to be married. We were, she came and picked me up, and we were going to her family's Christmas party. It was held at her brother's house. And uh, <laughs> I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where we were going. I didn't know where he lived. She's driving the car. It's a Ford Taurus. I'm in the passenger seat. She's in the driver's seat. We come up on this curve where we're getting ready to turn. It's in the country road. And we're getting ready to turn in something. I can't remember now what fell. Maybe it was her glasses or something. But she reached down to me. And I'm saying, pull, pull, pull. Pull, pull, pull. pull. And then we showed up, she had a fat lift, and I thought, great, her parents are going to leave too late. <laughs> I'm just saying it happens. I'm just saying it happens. Does that make her a mean, evil person who has no thought for human life, cares about kids? Ain't in it for nobody but herself. She's just trying to get to work, and I don't have time to stop for a school bus. Does that make? Does that make? Is that who she is? Because I'm going to tell you, that's what our communities are painting. That's what our communities are saying. Shame on us! Shame on us! Everybody's affected by this thing. Everyone. And we've all been distracted. We've all taken our eyes off the road. We've all had a cell phone in our hand. We've all received a text message. We've all sent text messages. Maybe you're saying I haven't. Praise God. Amen. Most of us have. For those of us who haven't, you know you've dropped something on your floorboard and picked it up. You know that you've looked over your shoulder at a child. You know that you were fooling with your radio. You know that there's been times, not 100% of the time, that you've been driving in your whole life. When you're in your car, have you every time been handed here and here and paid attention from the time you pulled out of your driveway to the time that you pulled into where you're going? There's been times you've been distracted. Yeah, but when you're younger, when you're younger, so even you've been distracted while you're driving. Yes. Okay. So we've answered the who's. We painted the picture. Now we're going to address the what. What can we do, Pastor? What can we do? You say, I don't think we can do anything. I disagree with you. We can do some stuff. What can we do? In this scripture, the Samaritan was moved to promote healing. And if you want to do something, you need to be moved to promote healing. If you want to do something collectively as a church, you need to be moved to pray. Pray for this mom and for this dad who have lost their children. If you want to be moved to do something, pray for the grandmother and the grandfathers who are going to weep and wail this coming Christmas because those children have vanished. If you want to do something, pray for the bus driver. If you want to do something, pray for that trailer community. If you want to do something, pray for that passerby. If you want to do something, pray for the school system. If you want to do something, pray for the community. But by all means, you hold the power of prayer in your life. I know this little group of people. We've brought prayer requests to you. You've brought them up to the Lord and we've seen prayers be answered. Brother Mark does such a wonderful job leading us every Sunday morning and taking up your prayer request and praying over our needs. And I've heard your prayers be answered, amen, because you are a group of praying people. If you want to do something, then pray. Pray for me. I need it. I'll pray for you. You need it. Pray for a church today whose pastor's stomach is in knots because for the first time he thought about closing the doors to the service because there's a community that is threatening to burn down his 
church. See, this is how serious that gets. Pastor, why are you being so somber? Why are you going after this like a dog on a pork chop? It's because I don't want us to write it off. It's because I don't want us to say, I never get distracted behind the wheel because I know you do. It's because I want you to be moved with compassion instead of contempt. Amen. I'm your pastor. I can't pastor somebody else's church. But I can pastor my own. And I'll agree with you when I agree with you. And I'll disagree with you when I disagree with you. And to say that that bus driver should have. What could have that bus driver done? To say that those parents should have held on to those children's hands until they got on the bus safely and sound. And how many of you do that? We've got what they call latchkey kids in our communities now. Where mom and dad are gone before the kid ever leaves to school. Doesn't make them bad parents. I'm going to tell you what, I had a good mom. She's going home to be with the Lord now, but I had a really good mom. And I've got a good dad. And they loved me. And they took care of me. And they provided for me. And they taught me. And they trained me. And they, and they loved me. But not once did my mom or my dad hold my hand while I cried. It didn't happen. And if that would have happened to me, it would not have been my parents' fault. If that would have happened to me, it wouldn't have been my bus driver's fault. Well, the school system said it. It's not the school system. We are living in a society that is so addicted to outrage and is so bent on being angry that somebody has to be punished. Somebody has to have the blame. Our society is so fallen that we cannot for one moment entertain the idea that accidents happen. That bad things happen to good people. And that tragedies occur. And instead of trying to rip one another apart and burn down churches, we need to pray for one another. Amen. We need to operate in the love of Jesus Christ. We need to seek to heal. We need to <coughs> get off of our high horses and quit saying, I will. Because what you would have done and what you have done, it could have happened to you. So what do we see? What do we see? What do we see? We see people are affected. We see people that want to do something and don't know what to do. What we can do is pray. What we can do is be moved with compassion and not contempt. And I want to tell you something. And I'm saying this as we close. I promise. I'm closing. We've prayed. We've prayed. I've prayed. Katie's prayed. Laura's prayed. You've prayed. I know you have. We've all prayed. We've got a community that has turned to prayer. And I've said, Lord. I need you to send healing into our homes. I need you to send healing into our communities. I need you, Lord, to send healing. I pray today, Lord, for a revival of love. I pray today, Lord, for a revival of compassion. I pray today, Lord, that you'll soften the hearts of these people in this community, Lord, because being so wicked and cruel-hearted to a family who really needs our love and support right now, to being so cruel-hearted to a church, that has nothing to do with any of this. Lord, people are angry. and we, we, just, we just need a healing. You want to know what I've seen? I've seen the healing has begun. It has. The healing's begun. I was in Burger King earlier in the week. And as I'm sitting there eating my sandwich, there's a whole table full. Six of them. I count them. Six. Fulton County police officers came in and sat down and ate lunch. Two little boys were sitting at a table with their mom. As soon as the police officers sat down, the two little boys were up on their feet and mom said, Get over here, sit down, get over here, sit down. And they weren't listening. And I'm thinking, man, if their mom did anything like my mom was, oh, you're about to get a thrashing. And she said, get over here and sit down. And they just ran. And they went, they went up to those police officers. And they said, thank you. I've seen those police officers just begin to melt. And Officer Schreiber, he spoke to them first. And the little boy reached up to shake his hand, and Officer Schreiber shook his hand. And the little boy said, when I grow up, I want to be a cop just like you. <laughs> and as I sat at that table, all of a sudden, I knew that God had heard my prayer. That there was healing because what them little boys maybe didn't know that I do know, I'm friends with Officer Schreiber, and he was one of them was on the scene that day and has to deal with what he has to deal with.
but to see a little child say, I want to be just like you. That had to have been a healing moment in his life. And I had to put my sandwich down and raise my hands in Burger King. People are looking at me like, what's he doing? And I'm praising God because my prayer had been heard and I seen a healing take place. Yesterday, was it yesterday? I was in, uh, I promise, I don't go to Burger King all the time. <laughs> that just happened to be in Burger King again yesterday. She had the hog roast. It was busy and I told Lord, don't cook all this cooking. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> but trust me, I'm not always in Burger King. Sometimes I'm in the mouth. <laughs> I walked into Burger King yesterday and before I could get in line to order, Somebody said, Pastor Thad. So I turned around and I walked over and I shook hands and he said, Hey, I've seen that video your daughter put on. Oh my gosh, that song has touched my heart. I said, Thank you so much. I'll, that blesses me. I'll go home and make sure she hears about that. Do you know there's... How many... Thirty thousand people have watched this kid's video. Thirty thousand. You might say, "I'm just one person. What can I do?" One person doing the right thing, being moved by the Holy Spirit to do something, <laughs> could do a lot. Pastor Thad, you go home and you tell that little girl here she's an angel. I said, "Thank you very much." And before I could get back in line, somebody else said, "Pastor Thad." So I walked over, and they said, "Hey, I watched that video that you put on there." tell you, we need that kind of truth today. And I just, oh, I'm so distraught. I'm so, and so I found myself consoling somebody in there and we agreed that, you know, we need to pray for one another. So again, I'm trying to get in line to order my food and get my coffee and I hear somebody else say, hey pastor. And I turned around and there's a whole table full of ministers. And they're in there with Bibles. And I walk over and I shake hands and I say, good morning, brothers, how are you? And they said, Pastor, will you lead us in a word of prayer? I said, I'd be honored to. So in Burger King, without ordering my food yet, <laughs> we held hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of us, seven ministers. We held hands, we formed a circle. And I gave a word of prayer. And when I said amen, the next minister prayed. When he said amen, the next minister prayed. When he said amen, the next minister prayed. And we were praying, not for thanks over the food or thank you, Lord, for another day, but we were praying for healing. We were praying for hope. We were praying for love. We were praying for compassion. We were praying for forgiveness. We were praying. And when I got done praying there, I thought, glory, hallelujah, once you get another, my prayers have been answered because I'm standing in Burger King. One of seven ministers in the same place at the same time praying the same prayer. And then I go to get in line again and somebody else says, Hey, Pastor. And I go, I just want to eat. <laughs> Thank you so much. There's hope for you. Right now, our hearts are broken. Right now, our minds are terrible. Right now, we're thinking, this is horrible right now. And, and it is. It is. The right foot is It is. But don't think there's no hope. Don't think there's no healing. Don't think that the power of love and compassion isn't at work. Because I got to tell you, two little boys believe there is. I got to tell you that a whole dining room burger case knows that there is. And I got to tell you, a whole congregation of people at the Omega Church knows that there is. So do you want to do something? Let's rise to our feet. Our God and our Father, as we come together this morning collectively, as individuals, yes, Lord, I praise you that you are the Lord of a certain individual. But I praise you, Lord, that you are the Lord of many. So today, Lord, as this congregation comes together, and we hold hands and form this prayer circle. I pray today, Lord, for each and every one of these people that's here today. There's been tragedy that is his. It's been such a heart-wrenching week. And I know, 
Lord, that there's those that are among us today that have shared the views, that have been angry, myself included. And Lord, we've thought hurtful things. We've said hurtful things. We've placed blame and we've pointed fingers. And we've said, if only. But Lord, today, help us to realize that our society is a fallen society. We can't fathom that accidents happen. We have to blame someone. Forgive us, Lord, of our sin. Help us, Lord, to be moved with compassion and not contempt. Help us to be healers in our own homes. Help us to be healers in our own communities. Search our hearts and forgive us of our sin. I pray today, Lord, for the mother and the father of those children. I can only but imagine the pain that they're feeling. Give them hope and heal them. I pray today, Lord, for the first responders that had to see such horrible, tragic things. Help them and heal them. I pray for families. I pray for school systems. I pray for bus drivers. I pray for passers-by. I pray for our communities. I pray for our churches. I pray for these people. Father, don't let us be overtaken with anger. Don't let us be overcome with outrage. But soften our hearts and heal us. Help us, Lord, to be the church right now because the world needs the church. Help us to promote healing. Help us to love. Help us to have compassion. Help us to understand, Lord, even if we don't know what to say, just let us be open ears for someone who needs to speak. Let us hug. Let us shake hands. Let us encourage. Father, this is the church that you gave me to pastor, and my heart is with these people. If our folks are hurting today, I pray for healing on them. And I know, Lord, that this wasn't an easy message to preach. It might have even been a harder message to hear. But it's truth. And I pray you'll allow this truth to stay in our hearts and in our minds. And help us, Lord. We need you. Father God, I love these people, each and every one. And I know that you do too. So I'm going to ask you once again, Lord, to please keep them all safe from harm's way. And bring us back. All of us safely and soundly together at our next appointed time. Where once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise I give to thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.